lovely to see so many of you here. Um, welcome to the Daiwa Anglo-Japanese Foundation. First of all, can I just do my housekeeping announcements, which are, if the fire alarm should go off, don't use the lift. You have to go down the stairs, down two floors, out the front door, and we should congregate on the park side of the street. And the second housekeeping announcement is, please don't leave any valuables in our folk rooms. Uh, nobody is looking at them. So, well, I know why so many of you are here this evening. Um, this is the third time over the last couple of years that we've had Damien Flanagan uh, to speak. Um, and he was telling us, actually, that the last one he did here has now been viewed 800 times on <coughs> YouTube, which I must say we ourselves weren't aware of. So, um, uh, obviously a very popular speaker, and um, uh, probably doesn't need very much introduction, but um, he is an expert on Japanese literature, uh, and has written a number of books, uh, both in Japanese and in English, different books. Um, and uh, in particular, he has specialised in Natsume Soseki, and uh, his latest book is on Mishima. Um, and he's also written about Japanese literature in uh, various uh, newspapers and magazines, again, both in Japanese and in English, I think. So uh, he tells me he's got a lot of material, um, which is great. So I'm going to pass straight over to you, David. Thank you very much. Hi everybody, thanks um, so much for, uh, for coming. Um, it's, uh, it's really great to, uh, to be here at the um, Daiwa Foundation again. <coughs> uh, part of the reason for this um, talk today is because uh, you may know that um, we're just entering two years of Natsume Soseki anniversary um, celebrations. But if you can actually celebrate somebody's uh, demise, which happened a uh, hundred years ago um, this year. Next year, a little more um, optimistically, we'll be uh, celebrating 150 years of his birth. Uh, he died at uh, the age of 49 in uh, 1916. Um, so both the, uh, the Japanese press and at uh, numerous places um, across the world, it seems a good time to uh, look back and think about uh, what uh, Soseki's uh, contribution is. I'm assuming that most of you, uh, if not all of you here tonight, know um, who uh, Natsume Soseki is, of course, the most famous uh, uh, figure, uh, literary figure of uh, modern Japan. Um, the, my personally coming back to uh, Soseki was um, partly uh, inspired by the uh, anniversary, but also also partly um, inspired by really starting to uh, think about uh, Soseki again myself. I kind of, uh, after doing quite a lot of um, uh, different things on Soseki, uh, going back uh, 10 years ago, I thought I really, it's very, it would be very easy to spend the, the whole of one's life on a topic like uh, Natsume Soseki, and a lot of scholars in Japan have done that, and I, um, I wanted to uh, move away, branch out, and I was doing things like uh, Mishima, and I've been doing a lot of research on um, Japanese film of late. But it's curious that one of the things that happens to you when you move away from a subject is you start to, uh, even without necessarily wanting to uh, go back into it, a lot of things that, that um, you've done previously start uh, um, nagging away at you. Um, when I started my uh, talk here on uh, Mishima, um, a year, uh, just over a year ago, I started with quite a spectacular image, which was the uh, image of uh, Mishima after his uh, ritual suicide. And I, I started by saying that if you were a, a detective at that scene, what would you make uh, of this uh, scene of uh, bloodshed and horror, the, of Mishima's spectacular end? Someone once said to me that it was... Uh, to Natsumi Soseki's detriment, that he didn't have such a, a spectacular life as Mishima. If he had, perhaps he would be a lot better known in the West than he is. But what I want to suggest to you is that the story of Natsumi Soseki in London is in fact every bit as spectacular as the story of Mishima, that it's one of the great stories of Japan in the 20th century. In fact, it's one of the outstanding stories of literature in the 20th century. And I, I want to sort of set up at the <coughs> beginning of this uh, something of a, 
central mystery, which is why is it that the man who would go on to be the greatest literary figure of modern Japan, why was it that he didn't start writing anything until he was 37 years old? Which in, even in today's terms would be quite old, but back in 1900 um, was extremely <coughs> late. In fact, interestingly, um, Sosuke's best friend, Masoka Shiki, the famous poet, had actually already died before Sosuke even began his writing career. I want to, uh, that, that question is, I think, can be answered only by considering what happened to Soseki in London. Um, when I was uh, reviewing this uh, just in the last few days, and I was actually rereading um, my, uh, uh, a book uh, I uh, put out about 10 years ago called The Tower of London, I felt a little bit like a, a detective opening up an old uh, case file and, uh, and reading through it. A lot of the details I knew then, I've actually forgotten now and had to refresh my memory. But some of the significance of it has, um, appears now different to me now than it did then. And I want to sort of uh, lead you through um, what some of that um, significance might be. I also want to ask another question, which is, why is it, uh, thinking about this again, I thought this is really extraordinary, isn't it, that Soseki should travel all the way around the world to England in 1900 at a time when so few Japanese had made it to Britain. Um, it was a quite extraordinary journey to, to make. He had the opportunity to do so, see so many things in Britain, in the West, that no other Japanese could do at the time. But what happens to Soseki? He actually ends up in virtual self-imposed isolation in a back room in Clapham, where he doesn't actually want to leave the room. He's sort of like a hikikomoriya of his, uh, of his day. What, how can we explain what, what happened with that as well? So I want to put in your mind those two questions of why is it that Japan's greatest literary figure, this is a man who later on in his career would be so incredibly prolific across so many genres that, that he was producing masterpieces that he could, he could write in two weeks, like Bochan, Kusamakura. He was writing those books at the same time as holding down three jobs when he had four small children at, at home. So it wasn't his work commitments, it wasn't his domestic setup. It was something else. What was it that was stopping this explosion of uh, literary talent? That's the question. Will we get to an answer? Let's see. So I want to um, just start off um, uh, at the beginning with, uh, this is a picture of um, uh, Soseki, Natsume Kinosuke, um, uh, as he is at the time, um, taken at the uh, time of his betrothal to his wife. In, um, this picture was taken in around 1894-95 um, when they get married. Um, by the time that um, Soseki is invited uh, by the Japanese government to come to uh, study abroad in London in 1900, he's already been married for five years. He already has a child, and his wife is pregnant again. Um, Soseki, when... When he gets the invitation from the Japanese government in 1900, he's living in Kumamoto in the south of Japan, where he has been teaching English literature for four years. Toke, Soseki himself is from Tokyo, um, but he had uh, moved first to uh, Matsuyama for, for a year, and then he'd taken up a teaching position in Kumamoto. But Soseki was very keen at the age of 33 to get back to Tokyo. He felt that he was being essentially uh, lost in the provinces. He wanted recognition for his, his talent. Soseki didn't particularly want to go abroad, but he was lured by the Japanese government with the promise that if he went abroad on this inaugural program, which would send three scholars, three uh, uh, outstanding scholars, to go abroad for two years. On their return, they would be given plum jobs back in the capital. And Soseki really wants to find a way of getting back 
to Tokyo, getting back into the, uh, the mainstream so that people actually recognize him. He's terribly concerned about his, his status and recognition. So it's curious that um, the decision to come to Britain, which was partly um, pressed upon him by the Japanese government, is actually a sort of curious way of Soseki getting back from Kumamoto to Tokyo. This is where um, Soseki was teaching at the time he gets the invitation from the uh, Japanese government. This is the fifth higher school in Kumamoto. Just before we uh, um, actually move to Soseki in, in Britain, I think a very important person to, to explain in the background of Soseki coming <coughs> is his friend Maso Kashiki, who I referred to before. Soseki, Shiki is, Soseki is essentially his best friend, but Soseki in the 1890s was very much operating in the, in the sort of uh, literary orbit of Shiki, who was his exact contemporary, but had already achieved national fame as a poet. He inspires Soseki to start writing haiku poetry himself, but Soseki never quite reaches the same heights of haiku poetry, although he's proficient at it. He's never producing the sort of masterpieces of poetry that Shiki does. But he's very much caught up in Shiki's aura. And he's, um, this would uh, prove to be quite important when Sosiki comes to England and the development he um, undergoes when he arrives in Britain. Um, when I was doing this uh, book on uh, Soseki in Britain, I, I asked at one point if we could put a, a map in to show his journey to Britain. This was dismissed as, oh, well, journeys um, across the world were very common in 1900. Of course, they were very common. They were very common going out, but they weren't very common coming the other way, for Japanese coming to Europe. Soseki embarks on a journey, which would, for, this is, of course, remember, somebody who at the age of 33 had never left Japan that takes in, the, the ship goes from Tokyo to Kobe to Nagasaki to Shanghai um, to um, Hong Kong, Singapore, Colombo. It goes up the uh, Suez Canal, uh, takes him to Naples, and finally he disembarks on Genoa. So it's an extraordinary journey where, where he, it, it takes six weeks for him to be uh, sent abroad in, in this manner. This would be um, a... a a great eye-opening experience for um, Soseki, and of course it was quite uh, disorientating uh, for him in, from the beginning. One of the really interesting things that Soseki writes in his letters back home, a letter he wrote to his friend Shiki, which was, was that he said he couldn't write haiku anymore in such alien surroundings. And that was to be quite an important point, because until 1900, Haiku had been Soseki's main creative outlet. And for somebody who, is, who turned out to be so innately creative, moving on that ship out of Japanese waters and into this unknown world closed down the haiku as his main creative outlet. So it's sort of like a kind of pressure cooker environment he's moving into, where he's now lost what was his his main um, outlet for creativity. One of the regrettable things that uh, really happened to Soseki on the boat was he got besieged by missionaries. The, the boat happened to have on it um, a woman called Mrs. Knott, who was a um, Christian missionary uh, coming back. I think her, her, she was coming back from seeing her daughter in Japan. And they immediately latched on to Soseki and saw him as uh, somebody that uh, could be converted to uh, Christianity and be a great hope for um, Christianity in Japan. The, um, unfortunately, the, the terms of this engagement were that they essentially talked to, me, to um, Soseki as if he was a, a child, somebody who, who had great difficulty understanding the, uh, the, these great Western concepts of uh, things such as divine grace. Of course, reading um, Soseki's uh, accounts of these things is really comical because you're talking about perhaps the greatest Japanese intellectual 
certainly of the modern era, perhaps of all time. And reading his accounts of uh, talking to the sort of middle-aged British lady who's trying to, uh, to, to tell him about the, uh, the, the, the true religion is, um, is quite hilarious at times. Um, it, Sosiki replied at one point when asked, um, when asked um, if he prayed, um, responded that unfortunately he didn't know any God worth praying to, which, which didn't go down very well with the, uh, with the missionaries. Soseki spent, um, goes uh, up through France, he arrives in Paris, spends a week at the World's Fair in Paris, and then on October the 28th arrives in London. Not the best, seasonally speaking, not the best timing, I'd say, for London, just moving into the winter season, um, which was to have um, a big impact on, on Soseki because he, he was really affected by the fact of just how dark and cold, gloomy and foggy London turned out to be. He moves, um, the first place he stays for two weeks <coughs> is a, a place called Eva Stanley Apartments, which was on Gower Street uh, near the um, British Museum. So Seki uh, later wrote a really interesting uh, uh, reminiscence of this, where he talks about how if you leave one of these houses and walk down a few in the fog, you've actually have no idea which one you walked out of and can't find your way back, which I must say is exactly my feeling when I'm, uh, when I'm down that area of um, London as, as well. The, there was a, um, a very small but tightly knit Japanese community in London at the time. And it was the, it, it was the case that if another um, person from Japan arrived, of course all of the, the, the small community were, were well healed and usually highly distinguished uh, people from Japan. They, th this network would make introductions to boarding houses that were well disposed <coughs> to um, Japanese lodgers. And Soseki immediately starts um, putting out feelers for where he might move to from this initial base on Gower Street. The reason he didn't stay here, incidentally, is it was too expensive. And one thing that, that rares it said immediately in Soseki's London experience and would, would become a, a constant issue is money. Because the Japanese government had given Soseki an allowance of £15 a month, which was, um, uh, I don't know if you're up on your exchange rates at the time, you might be interested to know that in 1900, one pound was worth 10 yen. So Soseki so was getting 150 yen a month, which back in Japan was big money. But unfortunately, when it was translated into pounds, wasn't very much. And um, the, the, um, he, the, that, uh, that uh, stipend he was given wouldn't have even covered the um, rent to stay on Gower Street. Um, he embarks... <coughs> In the first few days, in the usual round of uh, sightseeing, he goes to see um, places like the Tower of London, which would uh, come in very importantly into his uh, literary output later. But he's also looking to find where he's going to study. He's been sent over to um, Britain to master... Um, English literature, so he can go back to Japan and he can become the first native uh, uh, lecturer in English, lit in English literature at the at Tokyo Imperial University. So he feels he needs to um, uh, align himself with, with some establishment for the uh, educational establishment for the time he's in Britain. Mrs. Knott, who we met on the boat, introduced him to somebody called uh, Charles Frere Andrews, who was a um, connected to Pembroke College in Cambridge. So Sosiki goes up to Cambridge with the idea that he might, he might study in Cambridge. He spends one night in Cambridge and very quickly goes off the idea. <laughs> the, the flaw in the plan that he quickly sees is that, again, he, he feels, one, he doesn't have enough money that all the Cambridge students are, are extremely well off and can afford to take things fairly leisurely. He, he later writes that the students at Cambridge seem to do two or three hours study in the morning, then go off, play games in the afternoon, 
take afternoon tea, and then all go off for a jolly good dinner in hall at the <laughs> evening. Soseki is under this pressure from the Japanese government that he has to do something really important. He has to be this pioneer, this leading figure, this beacon for, for what Japan can achieve in the arts in the Meiji period. So he dismisses the idea of Cambridge, and he comes back to London, and he settles instead on a, 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 an equivalent uh, institution, uh, University College London. He signs up for classes, and he spends, um, I think he spent two months going to lectures at University College London. Uh, he particularly went to the classes of, uh, uh, the lectures of a Professor Kerr, who was an expert in medieval literature. After two months, he decides that this also is a waste of time. The reason for that is he thinks that what he's learning in these classes is actually not much different or better than the type of classes they have in Japan. And he's also wasting a lot of time commuting back and forward to them. So he abandons that idea. Meanwhile, he's moved to his first boarding house, which was on Priory Road in West Hampstead. Um, this was a nice area and quite a nice house. Sosaki wrote an amazing description of this house um, in 1909, so about eight years, uh, nine years afterwards, um, in which he, he portrays this extraordinary atmosphere of incest going on in the house. He implies there's sort of some sort of incest going on. There's a maid in the house, a young girl who's acting as a maid, who looks very like the son of the house. There's a stepsister, there's a German stepfather who looks like President Kruger, who they were currently engaged in the Boer War with. There's all these extraordinarily sort of seething, um, disturbing psychological things going on in this house. Probably, Soseki made most of that up. But when he wrote um, this piece called Lodgings in 1909, he was in full flow of his literary career. And by that stage, which was the, the sort of end point of what he was doing with his London material, he was, he was freely um, adapting it all, mixing it in with his own psychology, his own ability to create fiction. There were certain uh, aspects of truth in it. There actually was a German father in the house who had two stepchildren, but the stepchildren were actually full brother and sister. And in fact, because he'd, he'd um, put so many um, sort of psychological elements in it, many people actually wondered whether he, he completely made up the existence of this 15-year-old um, maid called Agnes. Um, it was actually only in 2002 when they when they published the census of, I think it was 1901, that uh, the very uh, assiduous Japanese scholars were able to look up who lived in the house and see that there was indeed a 15-year-old maid called Agnes, I think she was called Agnes Bruce, um, living in the house. So the characters, actually, that he described were in the house, but, but what he does with them is highly fictionalized. And what, what Sosiki was lending to that was a lot of his own um, insecurities and um, his sort of like uh, dreamlike uh, uh, reminiscences. So Sosiki himself had had quite a, a disturbed upbringing when he'd been passed out as a child from his own parents and raised by other family members that he didn't realise were not his true parents. So he had this whole <coughs> insecurity about the, dating back from his own youth. And he, he sort of blends this into his experiences in England. Most probably what went on in this house, in, in this story, Lodgings, he says that it's so uncomfortable, it's so seething with all these psychological tensions that after a month he leaves. It's a absolutely... Brilliant description. What probably happened is so it was just too expensive for Soseki. He was spending, the, the house cost um, nearly nine pound, two pounds a week, so um, uh, getting on for nine pounds a month. Soseki was getting 15 pounds 
from the uh, Japanese government. And he'd already set upon um, a program of, he wanted to buy as many books as he possibly could while he was in Britain. At the time, um, books, even second-hand books, were extremely expensive and hard to come by in Japan. So he saw this as a fantastic opportunity to, to buy books while he's in uh, Britain. So he wants to buy as many books as possible, and he wants to save money from the money he's spending on his lodging so he can transfer it to the books. So that's probably the main reason why, why he left this house. At the same time as um, that was going on, um, or uh, shortly after he, he's moved from that uh, boarding house, and, and after he decides he can't be bothered with university college uh, anymore, he decides the way to go is he's going to employ a personal tutor. And through Kerr's introduction from University College of London, he employs this man, who was called William Craig, and is a Shakespeare scholar. He was one of the early editors of the Arden Shakespeare. So Siki went to um, uh, take personal classes with him every week for about a year. Again, So Siki would write um, an amazing description of this man uh, called uh, Craig Sensei, which is a, a real classic. Um, of Japanese literature. In fact, interestingly, um, it was read at the time, again, it was written in 1909, one of the last things uh, Sosuke wrote about Britain. And it was read by the great Chinese writer Lu Xun, who was living in Sendai at the time, who was a, a passionate reader of um, Sosuke, who would in turn translate it into Chinese be inspired by it, write a, a famous story called Fujino Sensei, which is a classic of Chinese literature, which would again be translated back into Japanese. So it, it turned out to be um, extremely uh, influential. Again, Soseki, Soseki's description of Craig um, was... was um, a f he was writing this in, at the time when he was remembering London as a sort of dreamscape. And his description of Craig is extremely dreamlike and very carefully fictionalised. So, for example, one of the motifs that uh, Sosuke would be running later is, is about, um, uh, for example, he, he would, uh, the number four becomes very important, so that he has the characters always living on the fourth floor. This is a signifier for death and that these people are living in an other world that he's sort of visiting in a dream. Uh, these are subtle things which you could quite easily miss, and quite often are missed, by, by uh, uh, people who um, uh, sort of innocently uh, read these stories thinking that they are just straightforward reminiscences. They're, they're actually not. They're quite carefully conceived dream stories, uh, weaving in Sosuke's experiences of... Um, of what happened to him in Britain. Um, Craig was, in the uh, story, um, Sosiki remembers uh, Craig as an extremely eccentric uh, character. He talks about how um, he, 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 he rambles on about uh, literature and just talks about whatever takes his fancy. Um, he also talks about how Craig was obsessed with writing a Shakespeare lexicon that he had spent about uh, 30 years of his life. And he, he's got this wonderful description of Craig in his, uh, in his room in Baker Street, where he's got these 12 huge notebooks that he spent 30 years writing every last thing that occurs to him about uh, um, Shakespeare. In the story, um, the... In the story, the, the, the new of it is, uh, is quite devastating when Soseki lets drop that two years after he returns from Japan, he reads in, in the paper that Craig has died, and he wonders whether the lexicon has basically ended up, this man's life work has ended up as waste <coughs> paper. However, despite the way that Soseki presents it in that story, I think we can take it that Craig was actually quite inspirational to Soseki, because what he does is, Soseki sees 
that this man, who he has many resemblances to it in many ways, he associated, he was constantly looking for somebody in London who shared his poetic sensibilities. He was essentially as obsessed with literature as he was. And he found this person in Craig. But he also sees then that Craig has this sort of titanic ambition that he wants to do the definitive work on Shakespeare. This has an impact on Soseki, whether he liked to admit it or not. Which is this then sets Soseki thinking about he wants to write some sort of monumental work. This is the, the direction that he should be moving in. And this was to be quite an important spark for what was to come in the second year of Soseki's uh, time in London. I'll just briefly show you as well um, some of the other things which are going on in the London of the time. Uh, the, second, the day after Soseki arrived in London, he sees a, a procession of um, troops coming back from the uh, Boer War. Well, one of the things Sosiki writes uh, constantly about um, is the crowds of London, the fact that he felt so small, he, the, the busyness of, of London, the isolation he feels in, in London. And another very important event um, was to be the, um, the death of Queen Victoria in January 1901, followed by the funeral procession in, um, in February of 1901. Soseki stood in the crowds watching uh, Queen Victoria's um, funeral procession. In fact, he was actually, again because he was so small, um, he recounts how he was lifted up on the shoulders of his landlord so he could actually see what was going on in the procession. This is Soseki's final um, destination in terms of his uh, boarding houses, which is on the Chase in um, uh, Clapham, and which is today, I don't know if you can see, it's not really quite a blurred photograph, but uh, it's got a blue plaque on it. But before we get to that, I, unfortunately I can't show you pictures of the uh, and the other two boarding houses uh, Soseki lived in before he got to his final <coughs> destination because they no longer exist. But I'll just tell you what, what uh, happened. After he'd been in the uh, nice house, in um, uh, nice if uh, psychologically seething, um, house in um, West Hampstead, he moves to Camberwell, um, to a house that was run by two sisters, um, they, it had formerly been a girls' school, and so Soseki, they only had one lodger. The girls' school had had to close because of illness. It was a rented house run by two sisters, and the, the landlady um, had recently got married. They were called the Bretts. She was 40 years old. Her husband was 25. <laughs> um, so Soseki thinks with this that he's sort of settled, settled down. Um, and has found where he's going to spend his time in London. He's, however, slightly disappointed in, in the house, partly because he finds the landlady, again, insufferable, um, that she keeps, uh, again, like Mrs. Knott, speaking down to him as if he's a complete idiot. She starts asking him, does he understand the word tunnel? Does he understand what the word straw means? The poor woman was, of course, just trying to be helpful to Sosaki, and Sosaki was an extremely sort of prickly character, partly because he's so concerned about his status and that he's not being recognised as somebody who's actually quite important. In the house, um, there was just one other lodger, a girl called uh, Isabel Roberts, and another um, Japanese person stayed briefly. Um, the... The other Japanese person was completely different to um, Soseki. Uh, it's called uh, Tanaka. And he again riled Soseki by... Um, Soseki was getting from, back home from Japan copies of uh, Masoka Shiki's magazine, the Kuku, Hototogisu. And Tanaka saw it and said to Soseki, um, are you any good at poems? Which, considering Soseki considered himself to be an accomplished haiku poet, was extremely annoying uh, to him. And Tanaka's main uh, interest was um, uh, he sort of gathered about a lot, and he, he, he was a, um, a great frequenter of um, London's Ladies of the Night, which um, Soseki uh, very, very rectitudiously said that he would never um, 
uh, have anything to do with that type of thing. In fact, Soseki was um, very much waiting on letters. There's a very interesting sort of correspondence with his wife back in, um, back in Tokyo. Soseki writes her quite long letters, and it's interesting what he puts in these uh, letters, because some of them are uh, um, uh, quite amusing, in that he will lecture the entire letter on the importance of getting up early in the morning. She, perhaps not surprisingly, was very slow to respond. And um, what he didn't quite uh, realise, of course, she'd just um, given birth to a, a, another um, child in Tokyo, so she had uh, two infants to uh, look after. And um, she was also living off a very frugal allowance um, from the uh, Japanese government. She was on 25 yen a month, he was getting 150 yen a month. Um, so this was a source of uh, disappointment to uh, Soseki. Incidentally, it, it's interesting when one of uh, Soseki's uh, later masterpieces, Botchan, uh, consists of uh, Botchan going to Matsuyama, where he desperately waits for the um, letters from the uh, his his old um, the maid who's looked after him as a child called Kyo, and so he was actually infusing into that his own situation in London, where he was desperately waiting for the letters from his wife, who was also called Kyo. So the, these um, significances span out uh, uh, across uh, Sosuke's uh, writings in general. Um, one of the things that it's, it's also uh, worth saying about the, um, the house Sosuke moved to, he, 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 in April 1901, he writes an account called Letter from London that was um, done at Shiki's um, uh, urging that he should write something um, in the style of the works that were being produced in this magazine called uh, The Cuckoo. And the idea is that they would use this sketching from life uh, format to describe what life was like for the um, contributors to the magazine. The Shiki is urging Soseki to, to do something, to actually do some writing. Now, you might think from that, and it's, uh, it's a sort of standard interpretation, that Shiki was responsible for, essentially, for helping to create Soseki as a writer. Um, so, and this would be a classic example, because the only thing he writes in London is this letter from London, which is a, a really interesting account, straightforward, sketching from life account of what's going on in this uh, second boarding house. But I think what's really interesting is that I think in many ways Shiki was what was preventing Soseki from being a writer because he cast such an aura over Soseki that he, he made it that Soseki was representing himself in ways that didn't suit him as a writer. He was, he was writing haiku, but he was never going to be a great haiku poet. Shiki gets him to write this sketching from life style piece called Letter from London, which is really interesting, but is not what would distinguish Soseki as a writer. And one of the problems was that Soseki and Shiki were completely different um, personalities. Soseki was intensely intellectual and interiorised. And for Soseki to express himself as a writer, ultimately, it wouldn't be through descriptions of the outside world. It would be through exploring his interior space. And Soseki increasingly moves to a position where he sees that it's not, um, it's not a sort of uh, description of London, it's not an exploration of London that he can realise himself as a writer. It's actually through something more profound. He's looking for... He starts moving to a position where he wants to consider the absolute fundamentals of literature itself. Um, I'll just come to that in a minute, but just to... Um, about the letter from London, we actually have a first-hand uh, um, account, then, of uh, what's happening to Soseki in the second boarding house. And this then shifts him to the third boarding house, because he describes in this um, story, Letter from London, how the, the sisters have run into long-standing debt with the house, 
they, they essentially have the bailiffs moving in on them, and they're forced to move their operation to Tooting. And they, they say to Sosaki, oh, please, please, Mr. Natsumi, please come with us. Um, they describe the, this house they're moving to in Tooting as a new paradise. Soseki is already thinking that he wants to essentially bail out of this arrangement because he finds this landlady insufferable. Um, he thinks of moving somewhere else, um, and he receives a very posh reply saying about all the facilities this other boarding house has, but again, it's way too expensive for Soseki. And when he sees that, he thinks, yes, money priorities first, think of all those books I can buy, so he moves with the sisters and the husband to Tooting. So he's, he's essentially moving down and out, essentially, in, in London terms. By the time he moves to Tooting, he gets to the house. This is in April 1901. And far from it being a new paradise, he says it's even worse than the notorious slum of Camberwell. So he's not very happy. Then. Another Japanese called Ikuda Kikunai, who was a famous chemist and later to be um, uh, nationally renowned, if not world renowned, as the inventor of uh, monosodium glutamate, was, um, came to visit uh, Soseki and stayed with him at the house in Tuting. He and Soseki have, uh, Soseki really enjoys his company and he's particularly stimulated by. Um, Ikeda's ideas on science and it starts to think about Sosiki would later talk about uh, the, the, he feels under this enormous pressure to master uh, English literature but he, he's also thinking that how can I as a, as a non-native master English literature how, how can you actually get to the fundamentals of literature he, he starts worrying about what are the, why is it that there are all these differences between Japanese literature, between Chinese literature, between English literature. How do you actually quantify, qualify what these uh, differences are? He says it's like reading literature to get to the bottom of literature is like washing blood with blood. <laughs> so he's looking for a means that he can actually come up with something revolutionary and new about what literature is. And Ikeda gives him a prompt for this, that he thinks that a scientific route is the way to get to it. So he's already been prompted by Craig to think about writing some sort of titanic work. Ikeda now gets him thinking about the, the means in which he could do this. Maybe he could do it by producing some sort of scientific analysis on literature, something that had never been done before. This is moving him in the direction of producing his great work, the, um, the theory of literature, which was this essentially titanic project which he, he conceives, which he, he thinks it will take me 10 years to write this book and to, to produce this revolutionary analysis of literature. I will have to read not just literary works, I mean, Sosky was already enormously well read in English literature and other literatures, but he now thinks, I now need to read a whole raft of philosophy, history, art theory, scientific books, sociological books. I have to come at this from every direction. I'll come back to the theory of literature in just a minute. But in terms of his uh, lodgings, we've got a sort of uh, dual thing of his day-to-day -day life and his uh, intellectual life. In terms of his lodgings, Ikeda, who he's found very stimulating, moves from the house in Tooting. The, 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 the other Japanese intellectuals in London at the time were not as hard-pressed for money as Soseki was and thought, oh, we'll, we'll move uh, closer to the centre, thanks very much. When he moves, this essentially becomes the, the last straw for Soseki. So he then decides that he will move. And in the summer of 1901, he moves again from Tooting to um, the chase on um, Clapham in Clapham. Uh, which would become his final uh, boarding house um, until he left England um, nearly a year and a half later. Now you'd think with all this movement between the different boarding houses and areas, he finally found a, a boarding house he liked. He even spoke uh, uh, for such a prickly character as Sosik, approvingly of the landlady, that she could talk about Milton, she could speak French. This was a sort of... Uh, 
refined society he was looking for. You would think at this point that uh, things might, might uh, start to go swimmingly. Unfortunately, what he then gets into is he then gets seized by this idea of producing this revolutionary theory of literature. And he believes that he has to consume all these books to do it. And that the only way to do that is virtually every hour he spends outside is an hour wasted. He needs to get in that room with those hundreds of books and get to work on it because time is so, is so um, strictly limited. So, in fact, this would be the sort of uh, uh, the site of his nemesis, this, uh, this house in, um, in Clapham. This, um, this is a page from um, Sosaki's uh, Theory of Literature, which, which finally appeared in a, in a kind of uh, incomplete uh, form in 1907, I think it was. Uh, Sosaki had had to eventually abandon his grandiose 10 year plan. Um, but what he does produce is nevertheless extraordinary. It's a, a theory of literature which is both a, a, a macro theory of literature in the sense that it's, it's considering how does literature connect to different time epochs? How, how, how does literature change from the Elizabethan period to the modern era, from different cultures? But it also considers things on the intensely micro level. It starts off of, of the very first principles of literature, that literature consists of your consciousness by the, the second, by second changes of your consciousness and your involvement with the text you're reading. And he creates, the framework he creates for this is, you, could, you can see a, a time scale uh, running up there, which is running from minutes, hours, months. <coughs> He's, he's running then um, the subjects that literature books uh, cover and his other great um, uh, sort of correlative in this titanic theory of relativity he was creating would be the emotion. He, his idea is that if you strip uh, literature into its sort of scientific components, there are two parts to it. There's the actual narrative story and there is the treatment of the narrative. And those are his sort of fundamental building blocks, and from that he fans it out into a myriad of, uh, of uh, considerations of how do literary techniques uh, work, and what, what is their impact on your consciousness. Um, I have to show you this um, rather hilarious, I always think, um, uh, postcard. <clears throat> you may know that on the, uh, the chase in um, Clapham, there is today a Soseki Museum, and uh, this is, um, this. I don't know if it's changed as many years since I've been there, but this used to be the only postcard they sold at the Soseki Museum, and it says on it, Soseki suffers serious bouts of depression, 1902, <laughs> the Soseki Museum in London. So um, that's, uh, I always thought that would be uh, quite hilarious to send that to... Uh, Someone as the highlight of your time in London. Uh, this is actually not a genuine um, <laughs> telegram, uh, but uh, this actually when when uh, I, I was doing a, a piece for the uh, BBC um, some years back, and uh, we did a little mock-up of uh, a real-life telegram which was sent in Japanese in 1902 to the uh, Ministry of Education where somebody actually sent them a telegram saying Natsume has gone insane in London. <laughs> and this was the point that Natsume was uh, so sick he had, had got to his madness, so to speak, had, had become the talk of the uh, Japanese community in London. It, it, in fact, when I was reading this today, I was thinking, wow, this is, this is a bit like Apocalypse Now or something. This is like someone going down river and just completely losing it. And then uh, back home, they're like, how, how are we going to um, get him back? Um, another famous thing that was a sort of precursor to this was, which if the Japanese uh, Ministry of Education had been paying attention, they could have probably worked out something was going seriously awry was. In classic Japanese bureaucratic fashion, they ask you to uh, write uh, annual reports on your um, progress. And Soseki, after spending a year in London, 
submitted as his annual report a blank piece of paper. <laughs> so he was sending them a pretty strong signal about where he felt he was, uh, where he was going with his research. Um, I just wanted to put up at this point, uh, um, one of the things that, that I found very stimulating and uh, has made me think again about uh, Sosiki in London is, we had a very, this is uh, Lafcadio Hearn, um, who um, many of you may know is um, a, a famous um, uh, Irish uh, interpreter of uh, Japan, who at the time that um, Soseki was in London, he was the lecturer in English literature at Tokyo Imperial University. In fact, Soseki would go back to Japan and essentially take Hearn's job. He was pushed out. Um, Hearn today is um, an enormously uh, prized figure in Japan, where he's uh, known by his Japanese name, Koizumi Yakumo. <laughs> But um, we, um, partly because uh, we had a, quite an interesting um, symposium on, uh, on Hearn um, last year, um, I was doing a lot of reading about um, Hearn, and it really brought it home to me, the contrast between Soseki's immediate um, predecessor at Tokyo Imperial University and Soseki, because Hearn, who was a world traveler, he, he had left the island, gone to England, then he'd gone to America, gone to the Caribbean, gone to Japan, Everywhere he went, he was fantastically interested in everything that was going on around him. And he essentially wrote a book a year where he was observing all the, the sort of native traditions and things that were hidden, and he wanted to write back home about Creole culture. He writes, in the, he writes a dozen books when he's in Japan about Japanese culture and customs, which are, have all been translated into Japanese, which are regarded as classics. But reading all this made me think again about how extraordinary it was that Soseki, when he's in London, is presented with all those opportunities. You think all the places in Britain Soseki could go. I mean, this is a man who is absolutely steeped in English literature, knows the literary resonances of everywhere in the country, and isn't interested in going to any of them, and spends instead the entire time in this room in Clapham with these hundreds of books. <coughs> I thought, what an extraordinary contrast that that is. And of course, the reason for it is, is because Soseki has moved to this position that literature is not this, um, this presentation of the exterior world, which was the, very much the agenda that, that Shiki and his group of poets were pushing in, in Japan. He's moving to a position that no, literature is it's essentially a more sort of expressionist position. It, it's, the, it's the world refracted through your consciousness, through all your reading, through everything you know about a subject. That is where literature comes from. Um, I'll come back to that point in a, middle, in a moment and just explain how that eventually uh, manifests itself. But just to finish on Sosiki's time in um, Britain, when he's in the midst of his uh, nervous breakdown, um, there, there are two things which are which are attempts to get Soseki back on track. One is the uh, the landlady at his uh, boarding house, probably prompted by some of the Japanese community in London, tried to get Soseki out of the room and on a and to do that they encourage him to take up riding a bicycle and try to go out riding around places like Wimbledon Common on a bicycle, which he did attempt to do and which he wrote. Um, later about in a, in a piece called Bicycle Diary. The other thing is, they decide Sosiki needs a sort of recuperative trip somewhere, and they arrange for him to go up to Pitlochry in the Scottish Highlands, uh, where he goes in <coughs> October um, 1902. Now, in, um, this has a fantastic effect on Sosiki, because he, he absolutely falls in love with Pitt Lockery, and in stark contrast to everything he writes about London, which generally tends to be negative, he always rhapsodizes about um, uh, Pitt Lockery. He goes there at, at, at some of the just the sort of beautiful autumnal hues, and um, it, it has a, 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 a the desired effect that it brings Soseki back from the brink. Again, there's an echo of what what happens to Soseki in in works such as Kusamakura, his um, famous um, book um, 
the three-cornered world. So Seki leaves um, Britain and he arrives at the Promised Land, Tokyo Imperial University. He gets the job. They, they push out Lafcadio Hearn, send him packing, and so Seki's made lecture in English literature. He also gets other um, teaching jobs at the first higher school, which was a sort of like proto-university, the, the feeding school for the Imperial University. So in terms of what Sosiki's initial objective was in coming to Britain, he wanted to, to be placed in this position of uh, prestige in Tokyo. He's made it. But it doesn't actually turn out to be what he wants at all. He's still plagued with neurosis, unhappiness. And what's really going on, I should also say incidentally, Shiki has died in um, the autumn of 1902, which was a, a very big um, influence on Soseki. Um, Soseki then <clears throat> discovers that he's not happy doing the teaching jobs. And something has happened to him in, in London and with the removal of uh, Shiki from the scene. And he's essentially like a kind of volcano of creativity that's had all this, imp all this intense thinking about what is literature. He's got this sort of huge theoretical base inside him, this massive knowledge, and he needs to find an outlet for it. So the first thing he writes is this piece. Um, this is actually a, a translation I did in a, 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 a magazine called uh, Kyoto Journal uh, some years ago. The, uh, the illustrator took a bit of license with Soseki on the bicycle. <laughs> this is a sort of humorous account of... Uh, Soseki writes this when he's in Japan, 1903, but he's recalling the previous year when, when he'd been encouraged to go out get on his bicycle. When I did this book, The uh, Tower of London, I kind of thought it was a very humorous uh, piece. Um, that, but coming back to it again, I, I began to see it in a different light to the way I initially saw it. Because if you compare it to the previous piece, um, Letter from London, Letter from London is classic, shicky, sketching from life. Describe the world around you. And Sosuke does that does that well, but it was never anything that he was going to be remembered all time for. What's really interesting about Bicycle Diary is that this is then, it's Sosuke's repudiation of all of that. It's, it's no longer sketching from life. It's a, it's a massively exaggerated, comic, satirical portrait of himself <coughs> on a bicycle. And I think that what Sosik is actually really doing on that, if you really look at the meaning of it, it is getting on the bicycle is really, he's talking about the Sosik uh, of the type of literature Sosik was being encouraged to write. Sosik was being, uh, the whole milieu in Japan was demanding that he write a certain type of realistic sketching from life literature. This is the bike that you're supposed to get on. Soseki demolishes that theory and shows this in sort of exuberant prose uh, um, that, that, um, that he, he's not going to ride that bike. He falls off it. It's comical. It's, it's something else. So I think that the, 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 the hugely sort of burlesque satire he uses in that is quite significant in sort of clearing the ground for, for the great explosion of creativity that was to follow. The first outlet of which was to be his story, The Tower of London. Now, you might remember I said just in the first days he, he was in London, Sosiki visited the Tower of London. But when Sosiki writes this amazing story, The Tower of London, he's not writing, he's moved on already from this idea that you'll just write a sort of little account of I went to the Tower of London and did all this. He, he's now feeding into all the ideas he's been working on in the theory of literature. That the Tower of London has to be something... The Tower of London has to be some, something much more powerful than that. It has to be a, a symbol 
of, of so much more in British history. And for Soseki as well, it becomes, when he's talking about the Tower of London, it's the Tower of London for him is everything he's read which connects to the Tower of London, everything which his memory recalls about it, everything which he sees in sort of dream spaces, every painting he's seen in it, all these different elements come together in this story, and then he fictionalizes it and creates this artistic work. And it, uh, I'm afraid I don't have uh, time here, you'll be pleased to hear, that, um, uh, to go into uh, great detail about this story. But let me just say very quickly, just very quickly, some of the elements he, he produces to it. He sets the whole thing up like as if it's a no play, that the walking across Tower Bridge is like a character walking along the, um, the sort of bridge on a no stage, that you're moving into this mystical other world. The River Thames is turned into the River Styx. You're entering the, the underworld. He's got this fantastic idea of history in it, that the Tower of London becomes this great magnet in London that's sucking everything in, in modern London into it, that every second of the present is being pulled in to this magnet of the past. So it, it's not at all uh, a, just a description of the Tower of London. It's absolutely teeming with philosophical and artistic concepts. Um, I'm under the cosh of time, so I'm going to very quickly going to breeze through these. He then, this is what, what Sosiki then shows is his incredible sort of um, antithetical way of thinking. That Sosiki was, as opposed to the sort of uh, Shikiya school, that tended to have quite fixed ideas on things. Sosiki's mind was constantly seeking to, to challenge whatever idea had come first. And you get this in, in his very um, earliest work, such as as soon as he writes the Tower of London, which he talks about how this, this magnet of the past laughs at the, at the present and pulls it all in. He then writes immediately after it this, other, this uh, sort of matching piece called the Carlisle Museum, where he, he describes again crossing over to this mystical of the world across London, going into the home of this historian. And here he's presenting an antithesis of that, yes, it might be that every second of our existence is being sucked into the past, so it seems like the past is triumphant. But in this piece, he considers the reverse. You take a historian, a historian tries to commune with the past, tries to connect with it. However much Carlyle tries to concentrate on writing history, he can't do it. All the time, the present keeps breaking into him. He goes up to the um, third floor of this building. He insulates it. He tries to keep out the distracting noises of the world outside. And all the time, noises that he, that he didn't even imagine existed when he was on the first or second floor, they come crowding in as well. So Sosiki is moving in, the, in this um, in, incredibly dynamic way where he's interacting with really strong philosophical and artistic concepts, and he's using London as the canvas to express those ideas. I promise you I've only got uh, three more pictures. Um, <laughs> the, um, he also, again, I'm afraid I don't have time to talk about it here, but one of the really interesting things Sosiki does with his... Um, with these writings is Shiki and his school have been constantly talking, they use this concept of uh, sketching from life and taking this idea from painting. Soseki picks that up, runs with it, dissects it, takes it in a, in a hundred new directions. And one, all his stories are constantly engaged with this idea of how does the visual world and the literary world interact? And he does it from even the, um, the very earliest stories, the, the Tower of London. He, floods it with all these um, famous paintings that were connected with the Tower of London and which he'd seen in, in um, England's galleries. He, he was an enormous um, uh, um, connoisseur of uh, fine art. And he's asking the question, how, how, how do these uh, works, uh, how does literary and visual art connect? And ultimately, how, in what sense can... Um, can literature be said to operate in the same way as paintings? I'm afraid I don't have the time to go into that, which is a big topic, but uh, another time. Uh, in, in a uh, very uh, inferior way, um, I, I'm hoping in some small way I'm, I've uh, communicated to you that um, the interest of um, Soseki in London is not so much in the places Soseki lived, 
and the, the, the place and the people he met, though that is in itself interesting. But the greatest interest is in how London, what happens to London, this pressure cooker, creates Soseki as a, this genius, creative writer. Um, and that the London that most mattered to Soseki was the London he finally expresses in his literary works. And, uh, and, it's, uh, and it's those I would uh, encourage you to uh, explore. Thank you very much. <laughs>